Before I get started, I have a word for this church. You know, um, in the scriptures, in Matthew, talks about the authority that was given to God, to Jesus. And it says, all authority has been given to me. And um, no, I'm going to give it to Angelica, who is going to give it to Clarissa. Wherever Clarissa is, that belongs to Clarissa. <laughs> there she is, wonderful Clarissa. Can we just give it up for Clarissa? She just yeah. snuck out of the room. In scripture, in Matthew, it speaks about all authority. Matthew 28, we know that. And then Jesus says, all authority has been given to me, so go make disciples. Then in John, it speaks about all authority in heaven and earth was given to Jesus. And what he does next was he takes a towel and he washes the feet of his disciples. The word I have for you, Pastors Jerry and Kimberly, Jonathan, this congregation, my extended church family, is that more authority is coming. More authority is resting on you. More authority is able to be given to you because you make disciples and you wash feet. Because you are a clean house. This is a clean house. We established that last night, that it is a clean house. This is a safe house. This is a house where in every way I feel like to, to say that the Lord is literally looking and shifting his eyes throughout the nation and throughout the globe looking for clean houses. And he's looking for shepherds who will lead with the authority and using the authority for what he gave it to him for. And Jesus clearly used the authority of God to make disciples and wash feet. And this is what you're doing here. So, Lord, I speak this over this congregation. If you're part of this church, just lift your hands up and let the, a new and fresh empowerment, a fresh authority come to you right now. Lord, those that are here, Lord, and, and saying, God, I, I want a fresh authority. I want fresh uh, anointing, Lord. Let it be so, Lord, because you are pouring out a fresh anointing on this church today, Lord. You are uh, speaking fresh anointing on this clean house on this house that is a, a pure-hearted house, Lord. You are pouring out a fresh anointing and fresh authority, authority to take down demons, authority to cast out demons, authority to uh, speak healing, authority to, to raise up disciples. Lord, a, a fresh authority to walk in the prophetic, to speak what you say boldly. There's a new boldness coming over this congregation. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. amen. I mean, could I get somebody to move this for me? Because I'm just going to wander around. Look, oh, I, I got lots of people. Oh, but can I get a hug? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm a Mama Marian first and foremost. Um, <clears throat> the book. Let's talk about the book real quick. It is out there for sale, but I'm not really here to sell a book. I'm here to tell a message. And it's for sale for $14.99. You can get it on Amazon for five bucks more if you want to. That's up to you. Um, <laughs> but if you're here and you can't afford it, just tell them. Marion said it's my gift. Just please go take a book. Let them know you're taking one and have a book. It is my gift for you. Because I'm not really here to sell a book. I'm here to let you know there is a prophetic message on my heart. Amen? So enough about the book, but I am going to tell you about the book. Because that is my message. I'm here to speak about this message, Choose Life. And the, the bulk of the message is found in this statement, unlocking generational blessing by making spirit-empowered decisions that align with biblical principles. If we do this, if we live in this way, we will unlock generational blessings. I could tell by the response to Corey's message yesterday, this congregation is interested in unlocking generational blessings. And I personally don't know how to do it without making spirit-empowered decisions. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to come into our life and to fill us with his spirit to be able to make those decisions, because some of those decisions you get to, oh, I see my kids that I love right here. Yeah. Some of the decisions you have to make are decisions that are very difficult in life. And you need the Holy Spirit. How many of you need the Holy Spirit? Amen. We need the Holy Spirit to make those decisions. And we need them to align with biblical principles. So let me read you this text. <clears throat> we'll come back to this text at the end. 
I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death. Who's setting it? God is. Blessing and cursing. Who's setting it? God is. Therefore, everybody say it with me. Choose life. Choose life. Let's say it again. Choose life that you and your descendants may live. So who is going to get the blessing out of this? You first. That's right. And who else? Your descendants. your descendants. I don't know, Pastor Kimberly, but that seems like greater to me. That seems like greater to me that myself and my descendants will be blessed by the decisions I make, by the spirit-empowered decisions that I make. Our decisions to choose life definitely create an environment of greater for our lives and the generations to come. Sitting on the front row here is my grandson, James. I adore you. I am so proud of you. Yep. I was sending him sign language a little bit earlier, how much I love him. He's been playing up here with Lydia, my daughter in love, who I also adore. And, it, and this is like a picture of the generations because of James' amazing walk with the Lord. I'll talk about him a little bit later, but I just had to call him out just because there's a greater that happens. And I, on the other side of being young, not that I'm old, I'm not old. I'm just getting started because I hear people live to 100 and I'm only 68, so I got some more years left in me. So, right? And as long as I can, I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I have decided to follow Jesus. How many of you? This is my mantra since I was 15 years old. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's my decision. I get to choose that. Regardless of what happens to me, regardless of what goes on in my life, regardless of the drama and the trauma, I have decided to follow Jesus. This conversation about choose life is three things. It's a covenant commitment conversation. Because when he says, I've set before you life and death, and I, I, I bring witnesses against you. If you've ever read anything or heard anything, I'm sure this congregation never heard about covenant. <laughs> but how many of you know when he says, I've set witnesses, that's covenant talk, right? That is covenant talk. When he says, I have uh, brought Abraham, whenever you see our Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, you hear these three together, that's covenant talk. That's covenant talk. So you know this is covenant talk when you read in Deuteronomy 30 that he's having a covenant conversation with you. And a covenant conversation is one we got to wake up on. We have to wake up when there's a covenant conversation going on because God is giving us a greater for our lives because he's bringing a covenant conversation to the table. And in this covenant conversation, it is so important that we listen in. Uh, Corey mentioned yesterday that uh, he mentioned the scripture of Joshua 24, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. And he said, these are Joshua's final words as he was leaving this earth and he ending his ministry and, and finalizing things and he brings them back. But what Joshua is actually doing in uh, Joshua chapter 24 is he's reminding them a generation later of Deuteronomy 30 when Moses said his final words in Deuteronomy 30, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life. So this is now a generation later that we're beginning to hear. And Joshua is saying, I want to remind you of what our forefathers said. And he said this, and I'm saying this, let's make this happen. It's a covenant co converse, commitment. It's a generational conversation. Yeah. And it's a generational conversation that's important. I, I, I'm not a youth pastor and I never have been. But I'm one of the best youth pastors you've ever met. <laughs> and you want to know why? Because I live for Christ. Because I have decided to follow Jesus. What more could the youth, these two young people that I'm just getting to know here from Ty and Lilia's home, what more could I do for these two young people? What more could I do for my 10 grandchildren, James being in the room to represent the 10? What more could I do for the youth in my world but to say I have decided to follow Jesus and to do that? Generational conversation happens when the generations say, look, what I do is important for you. And it brings abundant living. I happen to live in a community that when it says, 
uh, you, you drive into the community and you're, it says you're entering into a, a abundant living. I'm always saying, that's so cool that they have a water fountain right there and there it says abundant living. How many of you want to have abundant living? Yeah. I think, Pastor Kimberly, that's greater. That's greater. We don't have to live the depressed, the unhealthy. We don't have to live in, in we don't even have to worry about the drama and trauma that comes our way because we are living in abundant living. So let me tell you about two words that I think are important in this conversation. First word is heritage and the second word is legacy. Heritage is this. It is what you're given in life and ministry. You've been given a set of stuff. Some of it's good and some of it's bad. I mean, Jesus was given a set of stuff. I mean, how would you like to be the kid on the block that caused every two-year-old and under to be murdered? That's part of his heritage. He couldn't change that. That is what happened, right? That's in the scripture, right? So, so Jesus had a heritage. You have a heritage. Some of it's good. Uh, I, I'm, I'm from a Mexican family, so I have a heritage of, and I make a mean taco and a very good tamale. <laughs> and yeah, so, you know, I'm the cool Mexican mama, but don't mess with this Mexican mama. <laughs> I may be short, but do not mess with me. I've been given a heritage of wonderful Mexican heritage. I love it. I just wish they had given me the language. <clears throat> Would have helped. Thank you very much, people. But I can't change even that, that they didn't give me the language, right? I mean, I can learn the language, but I can't change that it. it wasn't a childhood language for me. I also was given a set of trauma in my childhood. My father abused me from the ages of four to eight. I can't change that. But my legacy is what I do with what was given to me. I can say to my grandson, James, I can say it doesn't matter what happened to me as a child because Jesus has delivered me. Jesus has set me free. Jesus has given me the greater. Jesus has come in and healed this cool Mexican mama. And I can give something different. And the legacy, I control. The heritage, I don't get to control. So if you want to know what you can do with your life, look at your heritage and say, some of it's good, some of it's bad. Take the good stuff and move on forward. Take the bad stuff, get healed, and begin a legacy. As I began this journey in writing the Choose Life book, there was a text that became very prominent to me. I write about it in the introduction of the book. And it's this text. We repeat it a lot, John 10.10. Everybody repeats this text a lot. John 10.10 says this, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Right? We know this. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. This is an abundant conversation. So this text puzzled me for a long time. Because I would hear it everywhere you go, and I've already heard it in this conference even. And it's, been, it's quoted a lot. How many of you have heard this text before, right? So I was puzzled by it because I get the idea of steal. And these things are in order. They're a series, and I don't think it's a mistake. I mean, Pastor Jerry just said the word is for inspiration, all of it, right? And so we can look at a series, one, two, three, kill, steal, kill, destroy. Everybody say it in that order. Steal, kill, destroy. I get stealing. I had a beautiful handbag that was stolen out of my car Uh, one day. It was very early in the morning. I had gone to the gym. Not something I like to do. And after that, I decided, no, I don't have to go to the gym anymore. They steal bags out of my car. (laughs) Came out at 6.30 in the morning, and I was just like a hot mess. My windows crashed in, and my favorite bag is gone. And I felt violated. You know, have you ever had anything stolen from you in physical, like robbed from you? Um, you know, I know Lydia and Scott were in a bank robbery and at gunpoint. That's a whole story in itself. Like, it, you know, and as a mom, just hearing the story, it's like, what? You know, but it's a, it's a violation. And you've had things stolen from you by the enemy. You've had your joy stolen from you. 
You've had, uh, you've had good life stolen from you. You've even had finances where the enemy has, has come in and you've seen that thievery happen. And then there's kill. So I get kill. Kill is dead, right? Gone, annihilated. I'm gone. I'm out of here, right? I am gone from this earth. If you kill me, you're having a funeral for me, right? If, if, I'm, if I'm killed, I'm gone from this earth, right? Everybody get the picture? How can you destroy me if I'm killed? Why is destroy not before kill? I'll tell you why. Because the enemy wants to destroy even your legacy that you would leave on this earth after you are gone. The enemy wants to destroy anything that would be left of you even for the generations to come. The enemy wants to take your very life, not only to steal from it while you're here, to kill you and get you out of this earth, but he wants you to be annihilated out of the entire world, period. He does not want you to leave a legacy for the generations to come. The enemy of your soul is interested in taking your testimony and destroying it so that it cannot be left even after you die. That is no mistake. He came to steal, to kill, and to destroy your legacy. Your legacy lives on after you're gone. If I get the privilege of living till at least 100... I'm still gone. But I am telling you what. I plan to leave a legacy that will live on this earth after I am gone. I plan to keep preaching Jesus even after I'm gone. Even after I'm in the grave. Even after I am buried in the grave. I believe that my life should be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is in part why I wrote the book. Because... I knew that if I could get it in print, if I could put it down in print, if I could put it in print and say, this is important, people. This is important. And it's so important that there is a scripture that we commonly quote about it, but God says that he came to give you life and that you would live it more abundantly. You know, there's some things I didn't know when I was young. I first came to Jesus in April 19th, 1971. And I, some things I didn't know. I know them now. One of those things is choosing Jesus is synonymous with choosing life. I didn't know that. I just knew I walked down the aisle of a little church in Tucson, Arizona, gave my life to Jesus Christ. But I didn't know that in that moment I was choosing life. We've got to connect the dot back to the moment that we accepted Christ. The moment you accept Christ is an important moment in your life. It's an important moment in your journey because it's the first time that you really choose life. I didn't know that my decision to serve Jesus would stand the test of time. Here I am, 1971, 2024. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. It stands the test of time. I didn't know that pain and sorrow and grief would call that decision to fight for me. That decision on April 19th, 1971 was always prominent whenever there is pain, whenever there's sorrow, whenever whenever there's grief. I didn't know that then. I know it now. And I didn't know that my decisions to choose life would invite me into a partnership with God. Can you imagine that God cares enough about a little 15-year-old girl from Tucson, Arizona, that came out of a broken home, mother married and divorced five times, came from complete, absolute, utter destruction, was on a pathway of somewhere that was nowhere good, and says, if you decide to follow me, you get a partner with me. You get to do what I do, and greater things, and greater things. Listen, choose life. Here's a thought I want to give you. I'm going to give you three thoughts about choosing life. This is the first one. Choose life by making decisions that ridicule hell. Isn't that a great thought? I think it's greater. Right? Like, let's embarrass hell. Let's embarrass the demons. Let's make them so upset. Oh, she got up again. What? 
that, you know, I didn't expect her to do that. Like, I want to make some decisions in my life when, when the world comes at me, when problems come at me, when situations come at me. I want to make some decisions that are greater. I want to make some decisions that will certainly call hell to a place of embarrassment. Oh, shoot. She did it again. She did it again. I'll show you a picture of my husband and I. Pastor Jerry referred to how old, how long we've been married. We've been married for 52 years. There's the then and the now. There is a long road between then and now. That's a lot of distance between then and now for an Italian from the East Coast, a Mexican from the West Coast, a 16-year-old and a 22-year-old. 16, everybody breathe. You get to be married 52 years and still be young when you get married 16. <laughs> He's an old guy, though. <laughs> Joe, I love you. He's watching. But I mean, really, we had Jesus, but unless we continued to choose life, we would never be the couple in the second picture. Right. Wasn't even possible unless we would say yes to Jesus along the way, unless we would continue to say yes to Jesus, unless we would continue to choose life along the way. And trust me, there were some things and situations that happened in our life that would cause us to be that couple on the other side or cause us not to be. You get to choose what the end of the story is. One is heritage and one is legacy. The couple's coming into the marriage with heritage with a lot of baggage, a lot of situations, first generation believers. We don't even, hey, when I got, you know, when I got saved in 1971, I didn't know, I had never seen a Bible. And I didn't know there was a New Testament and an Old Testament. I remember seeing the Bible for the first time with my best friend's mother and father, and they were sitting, I was going to high school, and I saw the Bible, and they were writing it. They've got little glasses going like this, you know, and they're sitting in these little rocking chairs. I thought they were ancient. They were probably 50. <laughs> And I saw them with highlighters. I'm like, I said, is that the Holy Bible? It was where I came from. Only the priest had the Bible. The people sitting in the pew did not have the Bible. That was the first time I saw a Bible. So our then came with no knowledge. The only thing we had was our choice to follow Jesus. That's all this couple had. And if we didn't continue doing it, when we get to the dark soul of our night, this picture represents, this next picture represents a dark soul of our night. It's just one thing. It's, our, it's one of our one things in our life. We buried a child when I was 20 years old and Joe was 26. We are barely Christians. I'm only five years old in the Lord and I'm discipled. Pastor Jerry, I got discipled fast. I, I didn't know. That there wasn't a discipleship class. There wasn't OSL. That's why I was so interested in OSL. But there wasn't anything. But along those years, those five years, I had gotten in the word. And I, I knew the word. And this was our second child. And so I knew the joy of birth. I understood what that room should be like. And when Kelly Sue was born, she lived about five hours. And then my handsome husband, 26 years old, walked in the room. And I could see the weight of the world on his shoulders. I knew what he was going to say to me by the look on his face. And he came over to me with a gentle, gentle heart that I'll never, ever forget that moment. And I'm sure even now Joe's just remembering it and probably sitting in our front room weeping as I'm telling the story. And he came over and he told me, honey, she's gone. And I said, I know. And I grabbed him close to me and I said, we're going to serve the Lord. And he said, yes, we are. Choose life in your darkest of night. Choose life. This moment, we're going to serve the Lord changed everything. 
I didn't know it then. I didn't know what this meant. I didn't know when I pulled him close to me and said, we're going to serve the Lord. I didn't understand the power of that moment. I just knew that was the only thing that was in my heart. We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. Here is what that decision resulted in. A legacy of blessings. A legacy of blessings. You can flip to the next slide. These are our three children, three households, all households that love Jesus. I could, I'm a Grammy, so I could tell you stories about all 10 of those grandkids and my two sons and my uh, daughter and my two daughter-in-loves and my son-in-love. I could tell you stories about all of them, but I, I'll pick out a few things just to tell you quickly. In this bottom story here, the family is Scott and Lydia. They're our youngest. They've ministered here in this pulpit. Lydia's here with me. She's just beautiful. I love her. She is, I cannot call her and Angie daughter-in-law. I cannot do it because they're daughter-in-love. And I adore these girls. Lydia, I love you with all my heart. I believe in you. I'm going to pick on James because he's in the room. But James made his decision to follow Christ. I don't get credit for it, but I wonder, did this have something to do with that? Did this moment in 1976 when James wasn't even thought of, did this moment, we're going to serve the Lord, change this young man's life? I think it did. I am so proud of him. He's a worship leader. He's a preacher. He's a songwriter. He is diligent to serve the Lord. He follows Christ with all his heart. He's here because he wants to be here. He's sitting on the front row because he wants to sit on the front row. He loves Jesus with all his heart. If you think you care anything about your family, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to say, we're going to serve the Lord in the darkest of my night because there's a James that might be impacted. Let me tell you about another family, the one up here on the right. That's Carrie and Jeremy. And they're beautiful children. And they love the Lord. They love the Lord. They're watching two online right now. I'm just going to tell a quick story about Ezra. Ezra is 10. And I asked Ezra and Lucy the other day on the way to school, what's your most exciting thing about going to school today? Oh, we get to go to chapel. They go to a Christian school. And Ezra just asked his mom, can you please get me a cross? I want to wear a cross of Jesus. Did this decision cause that child to be able to want to wear the cross of Jesus around his neck? And then the top picture, Aaron and Angie, just amazing. Amazing, amazing family. Love them all. I just want to tell you a quick story about Abner. He's the guy in the plaid shirt. He's James's cousin. They're very close friends. And Abner came alive in Christ last year. He came alive in Christ last year and with about 30 kids sitting on the front ground of his church that they attend, in October, he got water baptized. And when he came out of the waters of baptism, he did something that struck me. And he said, yes! (laughs) And what this grandmother thought was this meant this. If you care about people in your life, you've got to say yes. You've got to choose Christ. You've got to choose life. You've got to choose life for these people. They're my people. Who are your people? Who are your people? Sometimes we think about, you know, I I, I had a situation many years ago. A woman uh, was... In our church, I was not qualified for this conversation, by the way. It was probably four decades ago. And, um, and she, she was suicidal. And one of the leaders of the church called me and said, can you meet me at the church? Can you please meet me at the church? You need to help me with her. She wants to take her life. And I'm like, what, what, what me? I don't know. So I had a vision of her while we were talking. And the vision was this. You know, I don't know how you can do this, but you know how the Lord will speak to you? Well, like all this is going around. She's crying. The other woman's desperate because she's afraid her friend's going to kill herself. 
and I'm feeling out of control, like I don't really have anything to say here. And all of a sudden I have this vision. I'm like, right now? All right. So the vision was this. A big semi-truck driving down the road, and her child is there. She had two children. I said, if this truck comes down the road, would you pull your child out of the way, even if it meant you had to be in the way, and you would be, die? And she said, yes. I haven't learned to ask that question in counseling quite a bit, actually. If you have someone in your life you love, my guess is your answer 100%, I've never heard anybody say they wouldn't, yeah, absolutely. For my grandkids, my kids, even the kids in my church, it doesn't matter. I'd probably do it for any kid. It doesn't matter. If their life was at risk, I'd jump in and give my life. I would do that. And here's what the Lord said. Ask her now, if you do that, would you also live for her? That's the heart of question. Will you live and choose life while you're on this earth? Will you be the hero that would die if the Mack truck hit you? Or would you be the hero who will live an everyday life and saying, I choose life, I choose life, I choose life every day, every way I possibly can? So let me give you the greater number two. Greater number two. Let's go to this next slide. Choose life to unlock missional purpose. When I was young, I didn't know I'd ever preach. As a matter of fact, because of the abuse in my life, I was terrified of people. When I had my firstborn son, I thought, I, all I can do is like hope that he cries. So maybe I could get in the nursing mom's room and maybe I could meet somebody and talk to him. But then I'd get in there and I couldn't talk. This woman couldn't talk. That's not a problem now, because I'm on missional purpose. <laughs> because the mouth has been unlocked, because the heart was unlocked, because Jesus said, you choose life from me, and I'll unlock your heart, I'll unlock your mouth. I will cause you to be able to do my mission in your life. You will get to be on mission with me. When I was um, just very young, I had Scott in arms and... And he was newborn. He's our youngest, Lydia's husband, James's daddy, which I'm very, very proud of him. He is an amazing young man, fiery preacher, such a theologian. He's just an amazing young man. And there he was just a couple weeks old, and we're in the church, and first time I take him to church. And while I'm in the church, we're in a church where, as Pastor Jerry said, you know, it's com common in some places where women not to minister. So I was in a church where women didn't minister. I didn't think anything of it. I was a first generation believer, but I certainly wasn't thinking I would ever be called to ministry because why would I be called to ministry? I'm a woman. That couldn't happen. So I'm holding Scott and the women are clucking around me and they're looking at this absolutely dreamy, gorgeous child. And they're looking at him and as women do, you know, cluck, 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 right? So, <laughs> out of the corner of my eye, I see a woman, her name is Chloe. Now, Chloe, in our church, women didn't get to preach, they didn't get to lead anything, they weren't elders, they weren't leaders, and again, I didn't think anything of it, it wasn't an issue to me. And so... But they were allowed to prophesy if a man would stand next to them, maybe give a scripture, or give a word of encouragement or something. When Chloe was normal on the platform. She would come up and somebody would stand next to her and she'd give a word. It's like, what does this woman want with me? She is not a clucker. She is not going to come over and say hello to this baby. That's just not going to happen. But she's coming at me like she's intense, you know. She's coming after me. And she breaks through the sea of women and she says, I had a dream. I'm like, okay. Right now? She said, yes. I'm always surprised at timing, right? And so she says, I had a dream. And I said, okay. And she says, you're pregnant. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. Baby machine is broken. We are done. We are, nope, nope. And she said, you listen to me. Very forceful woman. <laughs> I had a dream. You're pregnant with women leaders. And that is the word of the Lord. And I'm like, I have to tell you the question that went through my mind was, what in the world is a woman leader? Uh, we didn't know what to do, so we closed the sea back up, cluck, 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 go to church. But I went home, and I said, Lord, what is a woman leader? 
I don't know what this is. I don't know if this is possible. I don't desire to break scripture. I don't, I, but if you call me, Lord, I will do it. And he brought me to Luke chapter one, verse 38. When Mary, the mother of our Lord, was given the assignment of ministry that is like no other assignment of ministry that has ever been given to any person. And I saw it was given to a woman. And she said these words, Lord, be it unto me according to your will. And I got on my knees and I said, Lord, be it unto me according to your will. I don't know what a woman leader is, but I'll sure try to find out. I began to just show up at everything. I, my theory in life, if you want to be in ministry, is come early, stay late. That's like step number one. Come early, stay late. So I started coming early, staying late. My kids, I, I never had the theory that church would hurt my kids. I always had the theory that being in the house of the Lord was always good for the kids. So it never bothered me if they had to sleep under the pew. Like, you know, that was like way good with me. You know, that's not a problem. Like, why is that a problem? Somebody explain that to me. Uh, I like the kids in the house of the Lord. So, so my kids were in the house of the Lord a lot. They waited for me a lot because I was serving in the house of the Lord. I still, to this day, carry an apron everywhere I go because I learned first servant leadership. I began to learn about leadership. I began to see things. And over a series of time, I began to impact leaders nationally and globally. This picture, this next picture, is just a small picture of some women leaders that gathered with me in a gathering couple years ago in Orlando. These women are from all over the United States and all over the world. When you get in alignment and choose life, even the word you think that could never happen, you're pregnant with women leaders, will come to fruition if you will be able to have the missional assignment on your step, in your lips, in your mouth, in your hands, you will be able to do whatever God has called you to do, even if you can't see how it could possibly be done. All right, number three, and then we're going to close this thing up. Choose life by standing on the shoulders of giants. Well, I, I know I'm older than Jerry and Kimberly, but I was smart enough to see these people are giants of the faith. So I got close to you because I saw that if I could stand on your shoulders, I would get a new, fresh perspective. I would get something more of the anointing of the Holy Spirit in my life. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the many ministries and leaders that I've been able to stand on the shoulders. Let me show you this next picture. It's a very interesting picture. It's uh, stained glass windows in France. And it's a picture of the gospel men, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, standing on the apostles, standing on the shoulders of the prophets. This amazing stained glass window was not burned in the fire and it still stands today it is a goal of mine to be able to go there and see it in person but when I look at that I think to myself what an amazing thought that the apostles who were amazing stood on the shoulders of the giants of the prophets they connected the dots of generations there was a connection that was important. And we sometimes miss that connection. Let me tell you some things that I have in my head about this. Is you know, you know when a dad takes the child and they're in the summer and they're in the pool and the kid wants to be a giant. So the kid says, I'm going to stand on your shoulders. I'm going to sit on your shoulders in the pool. So here's what the dad gets out of it. The dad gets pure joy out of it because he loves the child. I've seen my own sons do this with their kids. My own husband do it with our kids. If you're a dad, you've probably done this in a pool in the summer. You put the kids on the shoulders and they feel like they're giants. Look at me, I'm standing in the water, you know. I'm walking on water. But what happens for the kid is they get a new perspective. What happens for the dad is they get water in their mouth. <laughs> they get kicked by the feet. They get hands over here. I can't eat anything. The perspective for the prophet was not the same as the perspective for the apostle. 
The one who sits on the shoulders gets a fresh perspective because the one who let them sit on the shoulders sacrificed themselves. I want to do both and. I've always wanted to sit on the shoulders of giants. I've always said to myself, I will surround myself with men and women like Jerry and Kimberly. You are certainly, certainly giants of the faith. You are worthy, worthy prophets to sit on the shoulders of. And you have given so many people fresh perspective, even at the sacrifice of your own perspective. At the sacrifice of your own life, you have allowed other people to see things and to have fresh anointing and fresh calling. I have watched you with leader after leader after leader come in and through this ministry. Some stay here, some go out, and many are out throughout the world and the nation because you've let them sit on your shoulders. You, yes. Could we all take this posture that someone may need to sit on your shoulders? You may have to sacrifice. See, you know, even when you talk about Mary and Elizabeth, I'm always enthralled at that story where Mary goes to Elizabeth. Elizabeth finally has her moment. She has her moment. She's finally pregnant. She had been barren for so long, and now she's pregnant and with child. And here comes Elizabeth. And instead of celebrating, I mean, here comes Mary, and instead of celebrating and and celebrating and making it a deal about her pregnancy, she makes it a deal about Mary. Could we take the posture to make it a deal about somebody else? That's what that picture is, that you can let people stand on your shoulders if you'll make a deal about them. If you'll make a deal about them and you'll celebrate them even when they get to do something you didn't get to do. Even when they get to go the places you thought you were going to go. Now they get to go to those places and you're still home. Got water in your eyes. And they're off preaching the gospel somewhere. And you're going, I sort of thought I was going to do that. You get to help push forward the next generation. On the other hand... I've also said to myself, I want to be somebody that they can sit on the shoulders, but I want to be one who will sit on the shoulders. I want to be one who's humble enough to get on the shoulders and say, I'm not as big as you. I need a new perspective. Can I please get on your shoulders? Can I please get on your shoulders? Pastor Jerry tells his story sometimes. I begged him. I literally hounded them to give me OSL (laughs) in 2007 because I needed it. I was like, no, no, you cannot say no to me. And they found out soon they couldn't say no to me. (laughs) But I did that because I wanted to sit on the shoulders of a giant. And I wanted what you had to go to my people. I had a perspective about it going further than they had a perspective about it. The minute I sat on their shoulders, I could see it going to the nations and it has. Come on. Can I have the worship team come back up just so you'll feel like I'm almost done? (laughs) Let me read a scripture. I want to read the text to you. And by the way, after I'm done, we're going to take a break and then Pastor Ty is going to come bring a word. I'm telling you, it was a God thing for me that... Pastor Ty and I could preach on the same pulpit in the same hours. I so respect you, and I'm so, so blessed. You are an amazing, amazing leader. Hold on. Can you put the scripture up there? Okay, good, because my cards are messed up. See, I just want us to hear the scripture. See, see, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you. This is not a suggestion. This is a command. This is not a good idea. 
This is not some lady trying to sell a book. It is the scripture of God that I command you today to love your Lord, your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments that you may live and multiply. And the Lord, your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. Can you read the next, go to the next slide? We don't like this part. But if your heart turns away, you know, we want to preach the sweet gospel. We want to preach the candy-coated gospel. We don't want to say, but if your heart turns away, what will happen? But I think it's time that we start talking. I so appreciated Natalie last night being so blunt and so forthright. But I want to say to you, we've got to get in touch with what happens if our heart turns away so that you do not hear. How many of you want to hear the Lord? Keep your heart on God. Because he says, when your heart turns away, you can't hear him anymore. And are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I'm telling you what he is going to say next will tie into that. I announce to you today. Whoa. I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. Wow. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. And here's the covenant talk. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you. Can we hear the next slide? That I have set before you, here it comes, life and death, blessing and cursing. Nobody's forcing you, but God is saying right before you in every situation, in every circumstance, whether it is a moment where you're going to choose life for the generations or whether it is a small little moment where you're picking up trash because you're not going to walk over it. I went in the ladies' room this morning, and the sink was all full of water. And I know this church, Tris, treats me like a queen. I could have thought to myself, that's not my job. But I took some paper towels, and I started cleaning up that sink. Because I choose life in everything. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants, you and your James, you and your children, you and your spiritual children... You see, I have spiritual children on this earth, not just my own children and my own tribe of 18, that we are an 18 strong now. That's my tribe, but I choose life for them, but I also choose life for for people I never knew that I would love. I didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know who I would know. Jonathan, in my life, before I even knew you, I was choosing Jesus for you. That I might be a witness of God's love and miracles. And when I met your parents, I knew how important it was that I stay the course for you. Angelica, you're in my world now. And before you were in my world, I'm choosing Jesus for you. Carly, I'm choosing Jesus for you. Ty and Lilia, I'm choosing Jesus for you and your family. This is not just about my tribe of 18. I choose life that myself and my descendants, which include my tribe of 18 and everyone who comes in my world. I'm responsible for every person that gets to see my life. My decisions make a difference to everyone. Every person that ever hears the testimony of God in my life. If I want the greater, I have to choose life that myself and my descendants may live, that I may love the Lord your God. Come on, how many of you want to love God? You want to love God in the darkest of your nights. You want to love God no matter what the situation. You want to love God even when you can't pay the bills. You see, when you choose life... That you may love the Lord your God and you may obey his voice. Sometimes I think it's not that hard. I don't mean to be, I'm kind of in a minute and quit it kind of girl anyways. I'm the girl that says, you're God, I'm not, let's go. Okay, so that's kind of my personality. But I get that sometimes there's deeper rooted issues. I get that. But maybe we've made it too complicated. Maybe I just need to say I choose life and therefore I can obey his voice. And I can cling to him. Because I choose him. For he is your life and the length of your days. And here it goes. 
and that you may dwell in the land. How many of you want to dwell in the land? He's talking about the promised land. You may dwell in the land. Moses is saying these are his last words, just like Corey said, Joshua's last words. These are Moses' last words, and he's not even going into the promised land. And this is what he says to them, that you may dwell in the land, choose life. Because I gave this land to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Covenant talk. Covenant talk. Can you stand to your feet with me? If we want the greater, we have to get back to the simple decision. You've either either decided to follow Jesus or not. You've either said yes to God or not. And saying yes to God is more than that moment of salvation. It's every moment. It's the moment where you're overpaid at the cashier and you hand them back the money. It's the moment when nobody sees you and you pick up the trash in the worship room. It's the moment for me when I repark my car 10 times because I'm a horrible parker and I don't want to take three spots. <laughs> Little family joke going on on the side over here. I bring up little things like that because it's easy to talk about this in a way. Well, that was the hardest thing I've ever done was to say, I'm going to choose life so that my grandkids can then do this. Yes. I, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. But sometimes the hurt or the pain of someone ignoring me, someone ghosting me, things happen. I love what your pastor said last night. We always think first the best. But sometimes, if I'm honest, my heart betrays me. And I want to think they did that on purpose. And I want to go to my corner and everybody hates me. But the Lord doesn't let me. He says to me, get up off your bed and stop your weeping woman. Do you choose life or no? And it always goes back to April 19th, 1971. I have decided to follow Jesus. Did we make an altar call or did we make a life call? By the way, you know, an altar call is covenant. So when I give altar calls, I never say every eye closed and every head bowed because I've never heard a preacher say when the bride came down the aisle, now everybody stand up and close your eyes. That's right. That's right. Because if I'm not misunderstanding the scripture, when I get saved and I say I have decided to follow Jesus, that is me getting married to Christ. I'm becoming the bride of Christ. So every eye open and every heart open and let us make a decision. Have we decided to follow Jesus or no? I have decided to To follow follow Jesus. Jesus.
I brought these young people on the stage for you to see that in your own bloodline, I love this young man so much that it literally hurts. He's my grandson. If you're a grandparent, you understand what I'm saying. I will live for Christ for you. You. These are spiritual grandchildren. That I really just am getting to know. But before I knew you, I followed Jesus for you. Because I care that you will follow Jesus all the days of your life. I have decided to follow Jesus. My song has been the same for 53 years. Your decision to follow Christ will stand the test of time. And it will change the generations And I am telling you that my message will be on this earth when this Mexican mama is in heaven. (laughs) You can go down. Oh, the Holy Spirit's saying so much. Stay here, Marian, please. The Holy Spirit's saying so much. One, one of the messages that the Lord is bringing to us is this decision in pain. Now, why, why is that a big deal? Because right then the thief comes and says, you see, look, you said you're going to serve the Lord. And look, what good is it doing you? right? The father of lies. As if Satan will steal from you and then say, see what God did to you? The father of lies. And Marion's decision and Joe's to say, we're going to serve the Lord. We may not understand everything, but we trust him that there are reasons behind all of this right we may not know all the reasons but one thing we know is he's on our side he is our savior without him we've got nothing that's so powerful but you know that's not the default for most people that decision but it became the default it became the default to where anything else that comes you know you don't have to stop and think well should we make that decision again it that becomes the default that was a defining moment to say this hurts worse than any other pain we've ever had and at that deep dark place we're going to serve the lord we're not going to believe the lies in our head that he is not with us that he can't be trusted that He's not going to bring us victory and eternal life. That our child is not going to be in heaven with us for eternity. Oh, no, we believe it all. And we're going to follow him even if we hit these serious walls, smash into these walls in life. And you don't have to contemplate it anymore, right? You just you make this decision to say, this, this is it forever. And then it wasn't the last hit. It's not going to be the last hit. But no, that, that decision is made. So you just, it just reaffirms. Just, yeah, yeah, well, we've already made this decision. We're serving the Lord. And some of you in here and some watching, listening, the Lord's saying, now you make this decision. Now you make this decision. Now. Because if you don't, You're going to get to that hit and the enemy is going to try to get you to set the default the other way because some people set the default in those defining moments the wrong way and never get out of it. And that's eternally damning. 
and that's part of his destroying, right? That's worse than being killed to destroy you eternally. And so, Mary, would you lead people? I mean, the Lord's bringing this and saying, set this right now. You don't have to be in the darkest place in your life to make this decision. If you, I think everyone here feels a sense of, if you have Jesus in you, you just feel a sense. But if you feel a sense that you need to make a movement with this decision, I'm not asking anybody to close their eyes, but if you feel a sense of doing that, just move out of your seat and come up here. Nobody's going to pray with you. It's just you standing and saying, I'm, this, this is, I'm going to do some business with the Lord. Well, I begin to pray. Just move out of where you are and allow yourself to just be seen publicly saying, right now I'm making a, I'm, I'm re, re, redoing this decision. And I don't mean just your salvation, just maybe you're going through something and you're just like, wait a minute, I, I don't think I was choosing life in that. So Lord, right now, all of us in this room, we lift our hands to you and we just say, Lord, we choose life. Lord, we choose to follow you, Lord. I know I've been walking with you for 53 years and I, I, I get up every day and say, you are God, you are my Lord. I know I'm not, let's go. Lord, so for all of us in this room and all of us online, we simply say, yes, we choose life. And those, Lord, that have moved from their place and said right in front of everyone, and if you're in your house, maybe you just stand up and say, that's me, I'm, I, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna renew this covenant with you, Lord. Because you're a covenant keeping God. You're a God who keeps your promise. So, Lord, for those that need that extra moment with you, Lord, would you anoint this moment, Lord? Would you anoint their standing, Lord? Would you anoint the fact that they made it public in front of everyone, no matter what anybody thought of them, oh God? I have decided to follow Jesus. That's my choice. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's my decision. I have decided to follow Jesus. I don't care what the circumstance is. Some of you have to look at the circumstance and say, that circumstance is smaller than my decision. The greater in this story is my decision to follow Jesus. The greater in this decision, in this, mis in this misery that I might be in, is my decision to follow Jesus. So Lord, we say yes to you today. And Lord, if there's any online or in this room, that have never said yes to you before today. And this is their defining moment. I pray right now, Lord, a prayer of faith. Can we all say these words together in a, in a declaration? I have decided, I have decided to, follow Jesus. to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, still I will follow. I have decided. I have to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. Amen.